Close down. Well, I think in, uh, instead of keeping all you people waiting, I think we'll introduce Dr. O'Neill now. I hope you've been waiting for this, as I have. Uh, my first exposure to this whole topic of space colonization was back in 1974. I don't know how you people variously heard about it word of mouth or so forth, but uh, I happened to pick up a Physics Today magazine and see something very peculiar on the cover that I didn't recognize, so I flipped through it. and right past the uh, article on urinary drop spectrometry <laughs> uh, was what I think may be, in some sense, a historically important piece of work. Uh, there are many ideas that come and go, and some are very attractive, and some last, and, and some fade. But the concept of having ideas is very important. In other words, it, it, it's nice to contribute an idea if, if only to be investigated and someday to be found that it doesn't work. In other words, obviously something as controversial as space colonization is not like rolling a snowball down a hill. Okay. But there are many failures which the human race has gone through, and two of them are a failure of nerve and a failure of imagination. In this case, by positing that there exists an answer, we have at least overcome that most important failure, the failure of an imagination. Okay, the concept of space colonization as I first came to it was very simply that we could go elsewhere for everything we wanted. We could move our industrial base, our power generation technology, our actual lifestyles off this planet without robbing anyone, without raping and looting our biosphere, and going to some place where the vacuum, the emptiness, the rock, the cold, uh, the sunlight were actual raw materials. I have always, since a small child, wanted to think that the human race was capable of doing anything that it could imagine. That, that, that there were no bounds except, you know, contradiction. That we could go out and do anything we wanted to do. And as a result of the moonshot, the people came back and said, well, the moon is made of very interesting things. And we can go there, and we can use that to build places where we would like to go to, too. Places just as nice and in home, and in many ways, better. And this, of course, has caused great controversy, at least in the circles I travel in, in the last five or six years. A lot of people that I've talked to have been very positive about the idea of a new frontier going somewhere, doing something positive, i.e., the world's not going to end because we're going to overpollute it. There, there is a, a solution. The world's not going to end because we're going to blow it up because we can go somewhere else when that happens. But <laughs> on the other hand, a lot of people I've talked to have felt very hostily toward the ideas we're going to be talking about tonight because it denies them their Armageddon. Okay? I am an optimist, and to think about the future and to plan for even 20 or 30 years to plan research at all means you have to overcome the failure of nerve, not just the failure of imagination. You not only have to be able to imagine something, you have to be able to lay down the dollars and cents, the time and effort. You have to, you have to ante up. Okay? You have to get over the failure of nerve. Now that we have been given the wonderful gift of the imagination to create an idea. We need that imagination to be continued. And that's why I think it was very important 
to bring people like Dr. O'Neill and the others working on this project to centers of academic learning because there's a tremendous necessity for input on this subject. The failure of imagination can be overcome it's each and every one of us thinks about what one's going to do and if you're interested in topics like this you work on it either to actively support it or actively defeat it as you know how you think evolution of the humankind should go. As to failure of nerve of course there's an educational side to space colonization. A lot of people have to know about it to be able to participate in the decision making process to see whether we're interested in doing it. I'm very excited about any opportunity that comes along to make a real long term investment that can pay off for every human being on the planet. I had a tremendous emotional reaction when I first came to this field. I'm still extremely excited about it six years later. I realize there are people that do not care. I realize there are people that actively oppose. For me, and I can't speak for Dr. O'Neill uh, or anybody else, all I can hope to do is to be left alone to pursue those goals that I would like to see happen and encourage everyone here to go ahead and pursuing those goals they would like to see happen. Now if through the educational experience of seeing some slides and hearing what may be a very important historical man talk, you also share that goal. And I think that's a very important and very meaningful thing. And with that, I'd like to introduce Gerard O'Neill, the man you've all come to see. Thank you very much, Mal. It was good food for thought in, in that uh, very thoughtful introduction. And I think I should begin by extending uh, my apologies to those people among the audience who uh, have been here twice with the thought of, of hearing me. And I have to tell you a little story about how that came about. There is a very nice lady, Peggy Davis, who takes care of all of my appointments, keeps my calendar up to date, gets my tickets, and gets me to the church on time in general. And there was a time some two months ago when on a Wednesday morning, I was quietly at home. It was not a day that I had to teach, and I had a lot of work that I was ready to do. And uh, there I was at my desk, and the phone rang, and it was Peggy from my office. And she said, I've got some good news for you and some bad news. And I said, OK, let me hear it. She said, well, the good news is that there are quite a lot of people who are interested in what you're doing. And I said, well, that's nice. I'm glad to hear it. And she says, when I tell you the bad news, you're going to fire me. <laughs> she said, there were 1,000 people in Ames, Iowa last night, and that's when you were supposed to be there. <laughs> so there was a long silence. <laughs> but it takes more than one mistake to get fired in my group. There's, that's some kind of of uh, rule, I think. So the, the relationship is still there and pleasant, but now Peggy checks things three or four times. <laughs> it is a great pleasure to be there. And as Mel says, I, I made some insurance by driving all the way to LaGuardia Airport from Princeton to take the only nonstop flight that one can get. While we were flying over Chicago, the pilot the sort of a devilish glee was, was giving us a blow-by-blow -blow description of how terrible everything was down on the ground and in the holding pattern. <laughs> to get on to our topic, as we all know very well, this last 200 years has seen an explosive growth in, in our scientific knowledge and technological capability. Uh, the result on the average, although of course there are big differences, has been an unprecedented rise in the living standards and the education and most importantly, I think, the individual freedom of action that people have had. Think how few would have been the opportunities available to all of us if we had been born, say, 200 years before our time. Very likely that we would never have traveled more than five or six miles from our point of origin very likely that we would have never learned to read and write. Uh, very likely that we would have led a very, very restricted life with very little freedom of choice. So things have certainly changed a lot for many of us. 
All of these changes have been very much dependent on available resources of energy and materials. And just within the past decade, uh, these have been very much threatened by an apparent approach to what seem to be the physical limits within our biosphere here on the Earth. It's been said, and in fact it is quite true, if we are restricted in our future to what is within the biosphere of the Earth, it is quite true that we are, all of us, passengers on this planet, engaged in a kind of zero-sum game in which one of us cannot win, ultimately, without another one losing. So as a result of that, some very strong forces, which I think are basically, in the last analysis, anti-reason, uh, ask in a kind of way that's uh, reminiscent of a have you stopped beating your wife kind of question. They ask, now that science and technology have failed us, how do we establish a controlled, rigid, static society? Well, I'm not very comfortable with that form of question. In fact, my alternative is, how do we use science and technology to extend rather than to curtail human freedoms? And an even more childlike or perhaps more, uh, more visual, more graphic form of that question is, what are really the physical requirements to achieve a high level civilization for all human beings who want it? And are they in the long run better found here on the surface of the earth or on any planetary surface, or are they perhaps found in free space itself? And the surprising thing, of course, is that when one begins to ask those questions, some of us at least, come out with the conclusion that the right answer is none of the above. The right answer is that the best solution is to go into free space where there is a permanent source of energy, solar energy that's there all the time in a very reliable way. The, the philosophical choice comes back to what you might call a choice between organizing scarcity, the zero-sum game, the limits to growth, or creating wealth and opportunity, an equality of denial in contrast to the kinds of freedoms which have traditionally been given by abundance. Well, the very idea that there might be important resources beyond the biosphere of the Earth uh, constitutes rather a revolution in world view uh, it's to some people, as all new ideas are, rather a heresy. I was amused that uh, Dr. Emilio Pache, delightful gentleman who is the president of the Club of Rome, which sponsored the Meadows Forester study called The Limits to Growth, was approached by a passionate supporter of these ideas that I'm talking about tonight. Uh, after they were explained, he said, thank you very much. I must tell you that we have considered the universe, and we have concluded that it is irrelevant. <laughs> so if you like, the, the subtitle of my talk tonight might be, The Universe is Not Irrelevant. Well, uh, as some of you know, there have been, uh, there were quite a number of congressional initiatives which were passed in the last, which were introduced in the last session of Congress in, in support of these ideas. And of these, I'm happy to say that one, at least, out of about 10, did survive and was enacted into law. It's called the High Frontier Feasibility Act, and it was introduced into the Senate by uh, Senator Harrison Williams. And in a manner which uh, there isn't time for now, but which I'll be happy to talk about in the discussion period uh, afterward, or when we repair to the uh, common room downstairs, I'll be happy to tell you how it came about, and in contrast to all the things we've learned about the ways that Congress works, it's something in which uh, there was no influence peddling at work, there was no personal interest on the part of the senator who carried it out, and as far as I can tell, it represents a very nice example of something that was done out of pure altruism. I, uh, I called up a friend of mine who happens to be at the moment the deputy director of the National Science Foundation. He went to Washington from Berkeley a year and a half ago with the thought that he was going to clean up the mess. And uh, when I talked to him a couple of days ago, he's given up on that. Uh, but I said, what about the High Frontier Feasibility Act? Uh, and he said, well, it's our understanding that, it, uh, that this was a mandate of the 
of the Congress and Senate and the Congressional Committee, and uh, we have no alternative but to go ahead and carry out the feasibility study, which is called for by that act. So uh, it's even possible that something will happen as a result of that particular initiative. Well, that suggests uh, a kind of, of a positive laying on of hands by the, by the federal government. And I should say that I have been very much impressed myself by the fact that all of the old cliches that I learned in school and out of school, and that I think were even rather true 20 or 30 years ago about the makeup of the Senate and the Congress, now have to be very severely modified. It's a very different sort of body from what it used to be. And I've been most impressed by the amount of uh, fresh ideas, innovative thinking, a lot of altruism, idealism that there is on the part of a great many of the senators and congressmen who are there in Washington at the present time. It may not look like that when you see an awful lot of the, of the bills that get passed, but there are a lot of people trying to make things better. Uh, however, uh, I'm afraid I can't say quite as much for the administration. And in fact, uh, it's interesting that this present administration, I'd say, tolerates this work. I think that's the right description of it, at a level which I've calculated to be one part in a million of the federal budget. And I suspect that Mr. Carter, who's an estimable gentleman in many respects, probably views me in about as friendly a light as Tsar Alexander viewed the revolutionaries of 19th century Russia. <laughs> well, I had occasion to talk to some people at the United Nations a few days ago, and a point that I made rather strongly there was that in contrast to the law of the sea controversy, which uh, is now in a complete snarl, the resources that are available in space are so great that no imaginable amount of exploitation, even over a period of hundreds or thousands of years, could deplete them. I think that we don't have to go out there with the feeling that this is some kind of a, of a very narrow range of resources. The first group that gets there is going to exploit them, and there's going to be nothing left for anyone who comes later. It's not like that. But this problem of the wealth or poverty of nations is a problem of many decades or even a century or so. And I think that any major new source of wealth can help. There's a very brief popular overview that I'd like to uh, give you now in the form of a film. It's a film which was made up for the BBC by the National Public Affairs Center for Television. And it shows you in a terribly oversimplified form some of the basic ideas that I'm going to be talking about tonight. So uh, if you will excuse the degree of oversimplification, I'd like to try to show that film at the present time. And I'll just say in its excuse that although it was made with a tremendous amount of love, it was made with very little money. So <laughs> please show it. Here Here, earth and water seem to strive again. Not chaos like together crushed and bruised, but as the world harmoniously confused. I think, I think we can have the lights back now. Lights? Help? Yeah, lights. Dr. O'Neill recessed to the bathroom or, or else was captured by friends of the vacuum. I don't know which. Yeah, they say the Vacuum Society has been threatening to demonstrate. You know, the exploitation of certain unlimited natural resources and pollution thereof. Yeah, that, that's a cutoff point on the film. We'll do the slides as soon as you return to. He might not have been teasing. I hope he didn't get lost. <coughs> Send Send Bill. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't want to say anything here because I don't want to spoil his punchline. No, I don't sing or dance. No, but I do have my good shoes on. I can fall down. <laughs> Must see these wax board floors are no joy for. Uh... I just had dinner with a man. I must say he's altogether too reasonable. He was not nearly as crazy as I had hoped. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. You get around the academic community for a while, you find it changes the character of people, and this guy could be a real person. <laughs> well, I mean, what he's doing at Princeton, I have no idea. He usually has a place where they send, you know, people that need to be protected from the environment rather than people who can develop the environment. <laughs> I know, I tried to get in. <laughs> Somebody who knows me over there is broken down in tears. <laughs> now don't you wish you'd brought your tomatoes? <laughs> Thank you, Mel. I hope you didn't have to do that for very long. <laughs> I'd always wondered what happened if an astronaut got mildly ill when he was out marching around on the surface of the moon, and I may have to find out about that in the next hour or so. So if you see me suddenly clasp a hand over my mouth and go leaping out, bear with me. The lecture will go on, maybe in pieces. The uh, it's not really that bad, but anyway. <laughs> well, even I think from this, this very simple film, you could appreciate the fact that there are some very simple and immutable laws of nature that these ideas are based on. They're not complicated at all. And although I don't want to harangue you with a lot of numbers, I do, do just want to give you some of the essentials. For example, there's the fact that on the average, the amount of solar energy, which is available, say, in any square meter, of area out beyond the shadow of the Earth, that average over a year is about eight times as much as it is here on the surface of the Earth, uh, even in a favorable location like Phoenix, Arizona. And the second is that uh, as far as the availability of materials is concerned, the energy cost of getting materials up from the surface of the Earth to be used somewhere in space, like if you want to put up a satellite or something of that kind, that energy cost is very big. In fact, it's like carrying something up a mountain that's about 4,000 miles high if you want to take it from the surface of the Earth and bring it up into a high orbit like geosynchronous or higher. The corresponding energy cost from, for getting something from the surface of the moon and bringing it into free space is less than a 20th as much. So in that respect, I sometimes like to say that we here on the surface of the Earth are the gravitationally disadvantaged. And once we get up where we ought to be, where the sun shines all the time, and where we can move around freely, uh, we have available to us much more material. And the last thing is, of course, the question of what about these materials which are out in space? What do we know about them? Well, that's what the Apollo project was all about. And the Apollo project told us that the moon is not made of green cheese, although that's good organic material and we shouldn't knock it. Uh, the moon is about 30% metals by weight, which is fine for fabricating structures. It's about 20% silicon by weight, which is fine if you'd like to make solar cells. And most of the rest, about 40%, is oxygen, which of course is already about 90% of the weight of water and it's about uh, oh, five-sixths of the weight of a typical rocket fuel, and uh, it also happens to be the stuff we breathe. So 
the moon, in fact, has very good and useful materials for us. There is just at the present time, for example, a study being conducted uh, under NASA sponsorship by Convair General Dynamics in San Diego. Uh, the study's just winding up now and will have its final review in Houston next month. And the, uh, the study concludes that taking a typical product that might be built in space in large quantity, this, this one being the so-called satellite solar power stations, which are very large objects, that one could, without trying very hard, at least get 90% of the mass of such a product from the lunar soil. So the approach that we've taken then is to try to be as near term as possible and as practical as we can. Uh, that isn't always the way that we're viewed, of course. But in being, uh, in being near term and practical, we try to stay completely within the constraints of the existing space shuttle system. And uh, the space shuttle, as I should remind you, is a machine which has already done its uh, free flight and approach and landing tests in the atmosphere. A number of flights uh, launched off the back of a 747, which commenced in 1977 and went on for about another year. And it will make its first flight into orbit, now scheduled for September 28th of this year. Uh, it's scheduled to go into regular operation past the test mode in a year or two after that. And then after that, it's just a question of what kind of a, of a job you have for it to do. Uh, NASA prefers not to be reminded of it, but the shuttle was justified on the basis of 120 flights per year. That would be enough to move into uh, low Earth orbit from the surface of the Earth every year some 3,500 tons of equipment. Now, uh, the present traffic model is much less, only about a third as much, but still everything that I'll describe to you tonight is within a traffic model of only about 60 flights per year of the shuttle and no more advanced vehicle than that. Well, I'm going to skip a lot of the engineering, uh, but I do want to assure you that a good deal of it has gone on, at least at the paper level and a little bit beyond that. Uh, the, there is, uh, as, of course, in any field, which has become, has taken on some popular notoriety, there's a lot of misinformation floating around, so I want to take care to point to you some sources of accurate information. Uh, one of the best is, is a book of which, for weight reasons, I brought only the cover. Uh, the book is never going to make it in the bestseller lists. The title is Space-Based Manufacturing from Non-Terrestrial Materials. Uh, but it is uh, volume 57 in the series called Progress in Aeronautics and Astronautics, which is a, is a very old and, uh, and properly respected one going all the way back to the time of von Karman. And this particular uh, book, this volume 57, is of special interest to me for two reasons. One is it represents the technical papers which came out of the 1976 NASA Ames, that's the other Ames, uh, study on space manufacturing uh, that I directed. And the second is it's the first set of papers on this subject which has gone through the entire scientific peer review process. And that, that I think, is, is a very important thing. Now, in 1977, there was a, a much larger study, about four times the size. We had about 60 people, 50 to 60 people, working for an entire summer on that. And they were very carefully selected, all very highly qualified. Uh, senior scientific people and some very bright students. And the result of that was about 17 technical papers in five different subject areas, ranging all the way from, from uh, ecology and biological systems, agricultural growth, all the way to habitat design and ranging through all kinds of very technical things in between, like the details of how you chemically process lunar soil into pure metals and, and silicon and oxygen and so on. And those, uh, those papers are about to come out, it should be within the next 30 days, as NASA SP-428, that's Special Publication 428, uh, which has a, a similar non-bestseller title associated with it. But if you just remember the numbers SP-428, that should identify it. And uh, I can't resist mentioning that there is also in a somewhat more digestible form uh, my own small book on the subject called The High Frontier, which uh, is available now in paperback. And as a first-time author, I also can't resist telling you that it won the Phi Beta Kappa Award as the best science book of the year. 
Uh, the, uh, I'm told that it's in short supply around Iowa at the moment, and therefore I lugged along from the publisher a little carton of 50 of them. <laughs> Which, uh, which just happened to be over there uh, where a friend of mine will make them available to the public. <laughs> well, the, uh, the point about the high frontier is that I, I found that the amount of misinformation in the area was so great that it was very important for me to try to straighten it out. And also, by an extraordinary stroke of what was sheer good luck, there was a nice time window of two weeks between the conclusion of the 1977 NASA study uh, and its final briefing, a two-week interval between then and when there was the final ultimate deadline when I had to give the Bantam Press the final publication manuscript for the paperback. So uh, uh, that's, that's what I did, was to feverishly rewrite and bring up to date uh, The High Frontier. And it's illustrated with about 60 line drawings by Don Davis, whom some of you probably know, including all sorts of habitat designs and, and so on. There have been quite a lot of, of translations of the High Frontier carried out, and I will give you one guess as to who did the first translation. Of course, it was the Japanese, and that very quickly sold out. And we have uh, quite a few others. I've just received them recently. I have a few that, uh, just to show you, covers. The Dutch version comes out uh, like that, and the two, I'd say the two most beautiful versions is a French one, Les Villes de l'Espace, which has just come out, and then probably the most beautiful of all in terms of sheer publication quality is the German edition of The High Frontier, which has just recently appeared. There are a bunch more translations going on, so I think we have some hope that whether these ideas may be argued about, as Mel very properly says they should be, at least they're not going to be immediately forgotten. Well, the long-term goal that we have in mind is, I think, an inevitable one, and that is to go after an unlimited energy and material resource for economic growth for all human beings who want to take part in it, with certainly eventual options that are very attractive to me of living in space in environments of their choice for groups of people that might even be very small, self-contained communities that might be as few as even a few hundred people uh, presumably kindred spirits who have the same ideas about how, how little they want to be governed or something of that kind, uh, they should be able to support themselves in a completely self-sustaining way in space with an energy source which is otherwise simply specific time scale associated with them. One attractive near-term possibility in application is satellite power. That obviously is time urgent, but it's not necessarily inevitable because there are many different alternative energy possibilities of which that is only one, and for many reasons it might not be the one that wins. The most recent thinking, uh, which uh, was represented by the very big study that I mentioned before, uh, is also representative of the general direction of the research that we're pursuing at the present time, and was brought out in the form of a special issue of Astronautics and Aeronautics a little less than a year ago. Uh, this was a 16-page color section which was put out uh, combining in it uh, one of the many uh, congressional resolutions, uh, also an editorial that they asked me to write, and a lot of uh, the latest color art from NASA, some of which you'll be seeing in slide form tonight, and then a fairly heavy technical article called The Low Profile Road to Space Manufacturing, which uh, outlined our ideas about the ways in which we could bootstrap our way into space, bringing up the minimum quantity of necessary equipment and people from the surface of the Earth, using that to process some lunar materials in order to augment the productive capability in space and so on, building up to a high productive capability without ever exceeding the limitations of the shuttle. Well, that is still the, the general direction that we're working on at the present time, the difference being that with every couple of months that goes by, someone comes up with a bright idea on how to do it even better. So that's been the story of the recent past. I'm going to give you a brief sketch of that approach now uh, through some slides. And in doing so, I want to 
uh, make clear, of course, that I'm not showing you the only way that things can possibly go. I'm showing you an example which has been worked out in uh, considerable detail, has been reviewed uh, by the regular peer review process, and seems to work. But it is not necessarily the optimal way, and we are even this month searching for better ways. I'll be involved in some workshops that will go on out, out on the West Coast, looking into questions of scaling and the question of whether we could actually get to what you might call the the economic takeoff point in space uh, with an even smaller investment than something like uh, 60 shuttle flights a year for a few, a few years. So we'll start now with a picture of the shuttle. This is a vehicle which uh, I'm sure you've all seen some pictures of. Uh, it's very interesting that as the shuttle is usually shown, it's like this, which misses the largest single component, namely the shuttle external tanks. Shuttle goes up like a rocket from Cape Kennedy. It's a vehicle about the size of a DC-9 and has a payload uh, compartment which is about the size of the passenger compartment of a DC-9. These are the rockets which help to bring it up. Then it rides on a very big external tank that carries all of the fuel for these rockets. And when it reaches essentially orbital energy, that tank, after a brief glorious life of about 15 minutes, suddenly becomes surplus. The original idea was it was, allowed, it was to be allowed to burn up in the air over the Indian Ocean, and that will certainly happen in the first few dozen flights. However, uh, we have some anguish about that because that represents a lot of very useful mass which has been brought up to a high energy, and we'd like to use that mass in a manner that I'll describe shortly. The mass of the empty external tanks is 35 tons against 29 for the maximum shuttle payload. Now, the uh, Shuttle, when it's up there, the question is how does it get back down? Well, it fires some very small rockets, just uh, really hardly more than steering rockets. As a result, it begins its re-entry, burns off its energy by, uh, by radiation, and has to go through an extraordinary flight regime. It starts at the top of the atmosphere at 18,000 miles an hour, and less than 15 minutes later, it's got to be flaring for its landing on a runway at uh, Cape Kennedy at 250 knots. So it's quite a vehicle, and I spent an enjoyable and very sweaty hour down at Houston a while back flying the shuttle simulator, uh, trying to do landings of the shuttle. <laughs> and uh, it's quite a beast. When the shuttle simulator turns on, you find yourself at 17,000 feet and going down at 7,000 feet per minute. <laughs> so you know that one way or the other, you're going to be on the ground in three minutes. <laughs> well. I made a lot of tries. It's a nice thing about computers that you can just, you know, push the button and go back and start again. <laughs> and as after the sweat wore off, I found that I had managed to put the shuttle down in one piece, according to the computer, about 50% of the time, which is 50% better than I expected. But please don't ask me how often I put it on the runway. <laughs> This is an example of some of the techniques that we were, we're going to have to learn in space. This is an example of some of the things that could be done entirely within the shuttle system, building uh, such large objects as this antenna array, which is shown here uh, in low Earth orbit. Uh, these are some of the shuttle external tanks shown used as converted, uh, converted to being living quarters converted to being uh, storage areas for fuel, converted to being storage areas for other equipment. And here is a shuttle uh, shown attached to that uh, set of external tanks. That apparently upside down view is in fact the normal orientation of the shuttle in orbit. Uh, it is oriented that way so for many reasons. The payload bay is then open uh, downward so that it can be seen by telescopes from the Earth. And the uh, windows of the pilot cabin are also oriented downward toward the Earth. It makes a heck of a lot more sense that way once you're in space where there is no particular up or down. So that upside down view is in fact the standard view. This is an indication of some preliminary research that's now going on at Princeton and at MIT on a device to overcome a fundamental limitation of the shuttle, namely that it can't go above low Earth orbit. And it's a thing which is called a mass driver reaction engine. The concept is, if you ask what is a basic rocket, in terms that I think are practical, although certainly not the language that Mr. Newton used, uh, 
A rocket is something where you look around for something that you happen to have on hand and don't happen to want. You then throw it away very fast in one direction, as a result of which you generate a push, which pushes something that you are interested in over in the other direction to a place where you want it to go. <laughs> so the operational question then, when you're in low Earth orbit, is what have you got lying around that you don't happen to want? And the answer, of course, is old shuttle tanks. <laughs> because if you uh, brought up, let's say, 30 shuttle flights, which would take six months, you'd have accumulated about 800 tons of well-chosen equipment in low Earth orbit, equipment that you'd like to spot somewhere else, like on the lunar surface. Uh, you would also have accumulated over 1,000 tons of shuttle tanks in the same length of time. So our approach, of course, is to say, fine, let's just pelletize or powder uh, that shuttle external tankage and throw it away very fast in one direction in order to provide a push that will push that 800 tons of payload up to the place we want it to go, maybe, maybe low orbit around the moon. Well, the device that might do that very nicely is this mass driver machine. It's essentially a straight line electric motor has a small uh, device in it, a bucket, so-called, which has no moving parts, but just a couple of superconducting coils. They are grabbed by magnetic fields from, from uh, ordinary aluminum coils that are pulsed with current, accelerates the bucket up to a high speed. It carries with it a payload consisting of perhaps half a pound or so of pelletized shuttle tankage, then releases the payload. The bucket slows back down and is returned for reuse. The whole thing runs on solar power and the version which would be used in space has been calculated out, uh, as it can be very accurately, to be more than 75% efficient. So the next question is uh, how to make one of those machines. And I'll be telling you more about that in a moment, but this is another illustration of the way to use them. This is a mass driver engine returning from orbit around the moon to low Earth orbit. And you see here other applications. This is still another mass driver machine. And up there in the background, we have uh, a shuttle and tug, various devices uh, that one would be using, the building blocks of construction in space. We've got to learn how to do assembly, manufacturing, and so on in order to make the operations in space relatively routine. Um, here is the group that built the first mass driver model. This happened while I was a visiting professor at MIT a couple of years ago. And the people involved are uh, Bill Snow over on the extreme left, who is now working with me at Princeton and is uh, carrying the entire load of building the accelerator part of the second mass driver model. Kevin Fine next to him, who got his uh, master's degree in uh, this area at MIT. Jonah Garbus, who's a congressional aide in Washington now. And uh, Dr. Henry Colm of MIT, who is carrying out, uh, who is carrying out the MIT part of what is a joint Princeton-MIT program under uh, NASA sponsorship. Finally, at the right is Eric Drexler, MIT graduate student, a fact which is very obvious when you see that he has Maxwell's equations on his t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and down here is the, is the first mass driver model, which was put together uh, over a period of two or three months out of essentially scrap parts, uh, and which then was demonstrated at the 1977 Princeton Conference on Space Manufacturing. That Princeton Conference, by the way, is biennial, and the next one is going to be this May, May 14 to 17 at Princeton, and in particular, May 17th is going to be an open day in which uh, anyone who wishes may come uh, at no charge and may uh, sit and listen to the summary papers summarizing all of the work of the preceding three days, the closed sessions of the Congress. The, uh, all of these are published by the uh, AIAA, and the books from the earlier two conferences are available at the present time. Okay, this shows another application of the mass driver, this one to uh, getting material off the surface of the moon. In this application, we would have a very small scale mine on the lunar surface, and uh, we would then bag the lunar material. It would be accelerated to essentially escape speed and directed quite precisely so that it would come out to a well-defined point in space. The mass driver for the operation on the surface of the moon turns out to be a much easier assignment. Uh, its calculated efficiency is about 96%, and it would run on the solar energy from that array, which is in the ground. In fact, uh, to give you a feeling for the numbers, 
it's calculated that if you are willing to supply it with enough power, and that requires some thousands of tons of solar arrays to do the complete job, a full growth version of that same mass driver, a machine which itself has a, a mass of only about 250 tons, would have the capability of launching into space per year about 600,000 tons of lunar material. So that's where we get the leverage that we're looking for in making uh, the material resources of space available for our use. Now, the first mass driver model was uh, shown at the Princeton Conference of 77, and uh, there happened to be an awful lot of television cameras pointed at it at the time. Uh, there was a three-hour television special in, in England, uh, which uh, was called Spaceships of the Mind. There's, there's just been a book that's been published by Viking. Uh, Nigel Calder is the gentleman who put that series together. And there's a book of that title that's just come out based on that TV series. But also our friends from uh, WGBH Nova in Boston did a one-hour special, which some of you may have seen. Uh, I thought it was very well produced. And they've been kind enough to lend me uh, about a four-minute film clip from that Nova film which shows the operation of the first mass driver model. So I'd like, please, to see that second film and appreciate it if you just show it silent. The first model is about six feet long. Uh, this shows the group loading the bucket into it. The bucket is the thing wrapped in the old red sock. And instead of operating uh, free of, of physical contact by a system known as magnetic flight, this first one was just riding on some old automobile starter brushes on some copper plumbing pipe. I hope you noticed that high quality aerospace switch that was used for the first test. <laughs> This is the series of drive coils, uh, which are successively pulsed. It's a self-timed arrangement as the bucket moves along the guideway. Uh, as it goes by each coil, it triggers that coil to fire and provide it an additional kick. Here, in the case of the first mass driver, we simply had frictional braking for the slowdown, whereas, of course, in the second and all subsequent machines, we would run it as a generator rather than as a motor to take the energy back out into electrical form. Uh, Dr. Colm uh, here is explaining what's going to happen, and here Kevin is putting the bucket into some liquid nitrogen so that it will chill down and have a lower resistance. Uh, we did not use a superconducting bucket in this first case. Uh, this was just uh, an ohmic coil. Now we're down at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University where the uh, 77 conference was carried out. This is the stopper for the bucket. Uh, and the stopper was really a lead brick into which the bucket penetrated a quarter of an inch or so. But uh, this is just some backup for it. Kevin's now explaining what's going to happen. And with our advantage of, of hindsight, uh, I can tell you that uh, we're about to see a failure. And the reason, so what you're going to see is Kevin will uh, lecture for a moment. Then we're going to have a very dramatic countdown by Bill Wheaton. And then there's going to be a big nothing, followed by some polite applause and, and laughter on the part of our friends. <laughs> and after that, there's another countdown. And on that second countdown, watch very carefully. And please don't blink, because that one is not a failure. The reason for the failure, you can see. This was a very humid day, Princeton in spring. And uh, the liquid nitrogen cooled bucket was so cold that it froze out water from the atmosphere and froze itself to the track, so it couldn't move. <laughs> so here is the countdown. And nothing happened. <laughs> You'll see a number of uh, familiar faces in that group. There's Freeman Dyson in the background. and. Uh, uh, perhaps some of you noticed Peter Veik, who has just written a, a very interesting book called Doomsday Has Been Canceled, that I can recommend to you. Now watch very carefully on the second count, on countdown, and don't blink. Okay. 
that was the test, and I hope you weren't blinking at the wrong moment. Uh, could we have the lights again, please? In that particular test, the, the bucket accelerated over a distance of about six feet from zero to about 85 miles an hour in a tenth of a second. It, uh, it was an acceleration of about 35 gravities. Well, the, uh, originally when I formulated the concept for the mass driver, I, I did some rough sort of back of the envelope numbers and concluded that it might be able in its ultimate space rated version to operate at 29 gravity. So already in the first version here, it did better than that. But uh, the very interesting thing is, is what's happening with the second model and that is being built by joint support uh, from NASA and from an organization you probably never heard of called the Space Studies Institute. And the Space Studies Institute uh, is a little nonprofit corporation, essentially. It's a, like a private foundation, which was set up only a year ago uh, with the general view that this whole subject was too important to be left to the government. <laughs> and, and then, And so we felt that it was worthwhile to, to just say, look to people if they're really interested in this. Uh, it doesn't take very much to get something started. And please send us your $10 and we'll see what we can do. And as a result, we, we said that innocently enough. And a good many of our friends responded, a lot of small donations and a, a very few big ones. And the net result is that uh, the institute now has grown to rather over 1,000 subscribers in, in only a year, even though we uh, don't have any advertising out about it, and the subscribers to the Institute, of course, get a very detailed newsletter uh, indicating uh, all the details of the research that's going on and the politics and who's doing what to whom and things like that. That's put out several times per year. And, of course, as you might have guessed, I have a fair number of subscriber cards for the Space Studies Institute. <laughs> so those of you who don't want to buy my book, please at least uh, pick up one of these cards. Uh, I'm, I'm being flip about it, but in fact it is, it is very important. The, uh, uh, the importance of the Institute has been in, in a time uh, when the government is obviously going through some uh, very severe waffling about whether there is a future for the country at all. Uh, the Institute is very important because it's not dependent on year-to-year -year funding. Uh, and we've had, we found the interesting result that the Institute has uh, had, has leveraged out government money in a manner that we never would have guessed. Because what happens is that uh, you call up Washington, you say, here's this really good research idea that ought to be pursued. And they say, uh, oh, gee, I just don't think we can do it. You know, Mr. Carter's just, just hit us on the head again, and you know, there's no hope. And, and then we say, well, we're sorry to hear that, but I guess we'll just have to go off and ask the Space Studies Institute if they can if they can give us a little bit of money so we can get the work started in some way. At that point, they start to scratch their heads. <laughs> and somehow it's surprising how often they come up with money that they didn't think they had. <laughs> so we find that the existence of an alternative is very, very important there. And it uh, very frequently happens that when you get right down to the wire, we don't have to spend the Institute's money after all. But it's very <laughs> important that it's there. Okay, well, there's a little, I guess, uh, human nature and psychology involved with that, but the, the details of the second model, which uh, Bill Snow is now uh, building back at Princeton, are that uh, it won't be much bigger than the first. In fact, the, in its first version, the accelerator part will only be about this long, about uh, 50 inches long, and then there'll be a drift space and a decelerator section. Transverse dimensions are about the same as on the first. However, it will be with a superconducting bucket and it will be uh, uh, magnetically flown. There will be no physical contact as the bucket moves down the guideway. It will run in vacuum and uh, in a moment you can see why it will run in vacuum when I tell you that it's calculated to operate at an acceleration of 500 gravities and that means that it will accelerate from zero to 250 miles an hour in 50 inches. In a, so, uh, I think it, it'll be kind of interesting. It's the, closest, it's the closest real physics approach that I know to Captain Kirk's matter transporter. And so, uh, in fact, I, I think there are going to be some very, very frustrated television people because what we plan to do is to have this thing with the accelerator over here and maybe a 
few meter drift space and then the decelerator section over there and we're going to say, watch closely now. <laughs> Push the button and here's something standing still over here and in the next television frame it will be standing still over there. <laughs> so hopefully that will happen if, if uh, under, under support of SSI and NASA that's now going ahead and we, and we hope that uh, it will be working and in display for the 1979 uh, Princeton conference about four months from now. Okay, if we could go back to the slides, please. I showed you the, uh, the lunar base. By the way, I think I'm running over time now. Should I speed it up? No. no. <laughs> okay, this is the lunar base, and I've explained that. And it, uh, interestingly enough, uh, to get it started, a total of 1,000 tons on the moon is enough to bring out 30,000 tons a year of lunar material. It's the calculation. Uh, this is possible control room for the lunar base. Uh, probably only a couple of people on per shift. This might be a girl who's running the computer operating the uh, mass driver. Might be a guy who's running by uh, remote video control, a little vehicle that's doing the scooping up of the lunar soil nearby. It's a very tiny operation by terrestrial mining scale. This is a concept for the uh, processing of lunar material in space. Uh, in the background, uh, there are some shuttle tanks converted to living quarters for the 80 or so people who might be there at that time. They're being slowly rotated on the ends of steel cables just to provide Earth normal gravity by rotation so that there won't be any bone calcium loss problems and things of that kind. Now, next two slides are, are amusing to me because uh, they show two different views of the world. This is, this is an engineer's view of what a private apartment in a converted shuttle tank would look like. Uh, there'd be about 21 people, seven decks, three apartments per deck, and uh, the engineers at the time that this was done uh, said that this seemed to them to be the best form for the private apartment. And then when the NASA artist got finished with the same concept, this is what it looked like. <laughs> Of course, you can see that it's got the, well, my wife told me it's not a potted palm. I thought, I said every good hotel has a potted palm, but no, it's really a hanging fern, but just as good. <laughs> and it has, of course, the computer console without which no young person would be, as well as some, some television on the wall and things like that. And I was a little bit relieved that at least the artist put in a whole bookshelf wall of books over here which at least partially outweighs the enormous waterbed that he put on the other side. <laughs> well, I mentioned that one of the possible products for manufacturing in space was satellite solar power stations. And this is a, a view of a very small part of one satellite power station. It's just a tiny part of the station, and over here for scale, the little tiny white triangle is a space shuttle. Now, a satellite power station is a big thing. It would be some 15 kilometers long in space, and it would weigh as much as an ocean liner. It would weigh about 100,000 tons. That may seem like a lot, but then I have to tell you that what it would produce on the surface of the Earth in terms of electric energy reliably 24 hours a day is equivalent to the output of 10 nuclear power plants. So it's really a lot of energy. Well, the, the world market for new electric generator capacity around the turn of the century is going to be equivalent to putting up something like 20 to 40 big plants of that kind every year. And so uh, obviously if that concept does go, there, is, uh, there are some there are consequences both economically and environmentally. First of all, uh, economically, that's a world market of the order of 200 to 400 billion dollars per year, which has got to matter to a country which is already running a 40 billion dollar a year balance of payments deficit, uh, which is now scheduled to go to 100 billion dollars per year deficit by 1985. And you already know what that means uh, if you do such a foolish thing as to try to go to Japan and buy yen. Uh, now, the, the question of environmental issues is that that would mean the emplacement every year of two to four million tons of satellites in synchronous orbit. There is, in fact, plenty of room in synchronous orbit. That's not the problem. But 
that's an awful lot of tonnage, and that means discharging into the atmosphere on the way up something like 150 million tons per year of exhaust products if you want to cart all that stuff up from the surface of the Earth. Obviously, then, that's part of the reason why we advocate doing it the other way around, never getting involved with the biosphere and getting the material from the surface of the moon instead. That's not the only possible uh, source of material. In fact, my colleague, uh, Dr. Brian O'Leary at Princeton, former scientist astronaut who's working with me now, has been particularly hard pushing the concept of getting materials from the asteroids. And uh, this is uh, one such concept. This shows mining an asteroid. This is its retrieval. Uh, and the idea there would be you'd send out a set of three mass drivers, as shown here. Uh, they would then be coupled to uh, about a half a million tons of asteroidal material, and you'd use an equal quantity of otherwise useless asteroidal material as the reaction mass to push this payload into the vicinity of the Earth-Moon system. Shows a kind of a close encounter of an honest kind, uh, this one being a gravity assist, a close pass around the moon uh, by that assembly in order to reduce the overall energy costs. This is another view of a mass driver powered ship retrieving a chunk of asteroid. This was done by uh, Mr. Chesley Bonestell, a name some of you may remember. He's a gentleman still alive and well at the age of 89 and painting pictures in Carmel, California. And I convinced him fortunately, to do one more space painting. So he did this one, microscopically detailed. You really have to get up and look at the original painting to see the detail. There are individual astronauts' figures out here on the, on the uh, asteroid. And in meticulous detail, I asked him, please, as an indication that I'd love to see this go ahead as a, as a peaceful, cooperative project, perhaps uh, of all of the nations of the world, I asked him to paint all of the flags of the United Nations on the ship. He said, fine, and then he found there were 150 members of the United Nations. <laughs> and so uh, there's a standard thing that happens. They, my friends from foreign parts come and start squinting at that picture, and I have to tell them very quickly that their particular flag is always on the backside of the ship. <laughs> well, although I don't want to bore you with uh, a lot of this, I will show one or two more pretty pictures. This is uh, uh, a very recently completed NASA painting, Earth in the background. Asteroid has been retrieved into that vicinity. There's some processing of it going on over here. And there is a mass driver powered machine in the background and a big satellite power station being built over here, 10,000 megawatts of capacity on the surface of the Earth. And there is a very useful scale here. In a few moments, I'm going to show you a large picture of something that in my book I called Island One, which is a, uh, what we presently think of as a particularly good design for an early space habitat. That's over here. And you'll think it's a big thing. But in fact, it's to scale. And the structural mass of this great big space colony is only about half as much, and its physical dimensions only about a tenth as much as the size of that satellite power station. So next, then, I'm going to uh, try not to bore you, but give you a 30 seconds or so of, uh, of economics. If I could just have the lights for a moment. Uh, the total investment has now been calculated by many, many groups. And it seems to be that we would have to ante up something roughly equivalent to one Apollo project to carry out a program of this kind. It's surprising that it's not bigger. But we learned a lot in the past 10 years. Uh, the return, uh, one Apollo project in today's dollars is 50 or $60 billion. That would mean an investment annually of about half of 1% of the federal budget. Apollo at its peak peaked out at like 1 or 2% of the national budget. So it's a lot less than that. The return in the first year after it gets into operation is already about one-third of that whole investment. You'd get back $20 billion in the first year just from the value of the power stations produced. No, it's not a national program, uh, but I, I think that it's very important that it be pushed at this research level. And uh, political climate is something which changes with time. And you have to be there and pushing in the same direction all the time, and being ready to push when, uh, when the system wobbles a little bit. And heaven knows the system is wobbling. <laughs> well. Enough of that. I'm now going to finish in the last few minutes with a, 
a change of pace, I'd like to end up with pure fun and games and say a little bit about what life might be like for the people who might go out and live and work in space. And I hope that some of them, some of us, are here tonight. The uh, slide that was just on the screen a moment ago, we could have the lights off, is a thing that we call the Crystal Palace Geometry, and it shows the essentials of a kind of Spartan space habitat uh, in which you have, in this case, some land area uh, housed in, in steel and glass. It's rotating on some cables, some steel cables, about this axis to make Earth normal gravity down here. It's within a non-contacting shell of lunar soil or the slag of the industries which is uh, enough to provide the cosmic ray shielding so that there is no higher radiation level there than there is here on the Earth. There's natural sunshine, which is reflected inside through mirrors, and uh, that is all of the essentials that you need. Out here is an agricultural area, which is much the same geometry. And for all of the several kinds of space habitat designs, I should say that Don Davis has, has set up uh, lighting diagrams in the line drawings in my book, which indicate just how the sunlight is brought in through various mirrors to each one of these space habitat designs. Here is a detail of the habitat. Then this is a, a view courtesy of Science Year uh, showing the interior of uh, an island one. And here I'd like to point out just that there's no reason not to have this very lush vegetation which is shown, perfectly possible. Uh, the Water vapor, which is once put in, will not go. You've got a constant humidity in that sort of an environment. You can make it to be whatever you like. The uh, fun and games possibilities are indicated by the fact that that's a one-tenth gravity swimming pool up near the top. And this is something that uh, I find rather appealing because of the fact that imagine how you would be there jumping up and down on a diving board in that environment. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's a, a great advantage, particularly for those of us who are getting kind of elderly and creaky in our joints, because we'd go up off the diving board and then have quite a few seconds to get our arms and our legs in the correct order before we <laughs> go into the water. And then, of course, the waves would come up around us in slow motion, so it should be a lot of fun. Well, the next is a fairly crowded picture. This is by uh, uh, Rick Guidis, a NASA painting and shows a number of things. It, of course, it's fanciful in the sense it's just one person's idea of what it might be. But every item which is in here is within the engineering mass constraints. Uh, this would be, for example, a circumferential river we could perfectly well have. And if you were absolutely mindless, you could get in a canoe and paddle your way <laughs> all the way around. <laughs> and you come back to the same place. Then, of course, if you had better sense, you could lie on the, on the uh, beach here, which is made of lunar sand, just as good as any other kind, and soak up a suntan uh, with the nice advantage that in a space habitat, you don't have to put up with flies or mosquitoes. <laughs> but then, if you chose to, you could walk up through the little villages that are shown here. You're walking up the inside curve of a sphere. By the time you get up here, interestingly enough, you only weigh about 70% of what you weigh when you're down here. And the higher you go, the closer you get to this rotation axis, the less you weigh. You go across a little bridge here. This is the bright area, represents the windows where the sunshine is being brought in. Uh, the very steep sort of Hawaiian hillside affair up here is probably quite realistic. Uh, you would have a, a steep region of quite low, low gravity with a lot of vegetation. Finally, when you're up near the top, you weigh almost nothing at all, and you're really skipping along. And by the time you get right up to here, you're at the entrance to the zero gravity corridor that I showed you before. Then you have a new possibility never available on the Earth that you simply give a gentle push and you simply float away in free flight, a distance which might be two or 300 meters until you get to the observatories, docking ports, or whatever. Even a place where you might keep your own personal spacecraft, a thing that may seem difficult and certainly would be if that spacecraft had to move down through the atmosphere but if it's only going from one place to another in space, it can be a very simple device indeed. Uh, out here is someone indulging in human-powered flight. Again, something very easy in 5 or 10% of Earth normal gravity. Now, down to the lower right is something I hesitate to describe. 
uh, but it represents a little bit of photographic realism and something that I have to put up with uh, that some of the best engineers who choose to work with me on this only do so after I give them a sworn promise that we can grow both grapes and hops in space. <laughs> and so what this is, is the photographically accurate detail of an institution known as the Paul Masson Mountain Winery Wine Party, which is the way, <laughs> which is the way each one of these NASA studies finished up. And to show the relative importance, it's even shown in detail over here. But passing over that lightly, uh, now the question is, uh, we've talked about what life might be like in space, but the question is, how do you get there from here? Well, obviously you go up from the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit in the space shuttle, and it's interesting and instructive that even under the present extremely constrained plans for activities in space, not including any of these possibilities that I've shown here. By 1990, there will have been 500 different human beings into space and back again. And that's just within the very constrained program that is now envisaged by NASA. So from there, it can only go up. Now, uh, there are on the drawing boards, uh, although they tend to be hidden under blotters in the present administration, uh, some nice drawings that show how you could uh, put in passenger modules with 60 to 100 passengers in a shuttle going up. So uh, if you were to devote the shuttle to passenger carrying, it would in fact be quite practical for several thousand people per year to go up into space and back again. The difficulty is to go from low Earth orbit up to the location of a space habitat, which might be two-thirds of the way out toward the moon. And there you need a ship rather than an airplane. And uh, this is an indication of one such ship, something uh, which in my book I called the, the Robert Goddard. It would be a ship built in space. Sensibly enough, you build a ship at a seaport. You build, uh, you build a spaceship in space rather than hauling it up the 4,000 mile high gravitational hill that we're at the wrong end of at the present time. Uh, for comparison, this mass driver powered ship that might carry a couple of thousand passengers could be built out of just 1% of the productive capacity that there would be in space within a year or two of the completion of that program that I indicated to you. So it's not a very big thing indeed. This indicates how big one could build a space habitat. We're now getting clearly some time well out into the next century. Uh, this is something we called Island 3. And it happens to be one of the earliest exercises I carried out in, in this uh, area. I asked the question, within the limitations of the sort of steel and glass and aluminum, all the ordinary things out of which this building is built of, for example, <coughs> how big could one build a habitat in space at Earth normal gravity and with a good atmospheric pressure with natural sunlight? And the answer came back that one could build something four miles in diameter and with 100 square miles of land area. So it could be very Earth-like indeed. And here it's shown with something, again, that we don't have the possibility of here on the Earth. All of the, gra all of the agricultural areas would be independent and on the outside. They could have their own climate and season. It could even run January, February, March, April, May, if you like. <laughs> so there's no reason not to have fresh fruit and vegetables every month of the year, even a month where you might happen to, be want, to, to want to be skiing on the inside of this habitat. There again, there are two of these things coupled together, and you have the nice possibility that they can be at completely different climates. One can be in the climate of New England, the other of Hawaii, if you like, and you can have people going with skis in one direction and surfboards in the other. Nothing wrong with it. The final picture I'd like to show is by Don Davis and is uh, obviously by someone who was brought up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, <laughs> His view is taken from high inside the end cap, hemispherical end cap at the end of one of those large cylinders, and is a view looking down into the beginning of the valley area with uh, some of the agricultural cylinders on the outside seen through the windows. Uh, the, uh, that's, of course, just one of many possibilities. Uh, I think that uh, what I'm trying to do, obviously, is not to prescribe uh, a single way that this can go, but rather to indicate that there are a great many different possibilities and that I hope people will make use of them. Now, if I could have the lights, please. The, to try to, for those of you who may uh, be at this point uh, a little bit in a whirlwind, I 
I'd like to just recap by saying that the, the idea here is that the industrial growth in the world is now being checked by an apparent resource limit and at a very tragic time, namely just as most nations uh, have yet to make what I might call the industrial transition, the transition to relative uh, affluence and a corresponding uh, stable population, decent living standards and so on, uh, decided on by free individual choice. Uh, very fortunately though, just at this very critical time, we are acquiring the ability to reach out into what I think we can properly call a new high frontier, uh, which is really unimaginably rich in resources both of matter and energy. I didn't bore you with a lot of numbers, but just within the known resources of the asteroid belt alone, there is enough material to build land area equal to 3,000 times the land area of the Earth. And that's just one class of resources already well known. Uh, well, nobody's going to do it for us. That's the obvious thing. We have to do it ourselves, and that's the role that the Space Studies Institute plays. And uh, one of the people who supported it has said that in a shifting world, in what is called the time of timidity, uh, the Institute is, in his phrase, our guardian of commitment and of integrity. And I think then that's the note that I'd like to close on by just saying that uh, with your help, I think that we can strengthen its force. And if we do so, I think it's really possible that we can bring about in our lifetime what I'd like to call the humanization of space. Thank you. <laughs>